Good evening, and welcome to Creighton University's 2020 Marku Dupour Annual Social Justice Lecture. My name is Dan DeLeo, and I'm a Catholic theologian and director of Creighton's Justice and Peace Studies program. The JPS program offers a uniquely interdisciplinary major and minor that combine coursework in theology and the social sciences to help students effectively enact the Ignatian ideal of the faith that does justice and seeks reconciliation. As part of the JPS mission, which supports that of Creighton University, the program's founding director, Roger Bergman, began the Marcoux de Poor lecture series in 1996. His vision was to address pressing social justice issues, especially informed by the wisdom of Catholic social thought. To this end, Dr. Bergman named the series after two exemplary figures. The first is the Jesuit Father John Marcoux, a former Creighton professor who started the Omaha de Poor Club in 1947 to advance racial justice. The second is St. Martin de Poor, namesake of Father Marcoux's Omaha Club and Catholic patron saint of racial harmony and social justice. The Omaha Marcoux de Poor lecture has brought more than two dozen distinguished thinkers to Creighton's campus. This year's event continues that tradition, but now in this online format. Given our topic and the caliber of our speakers, I'm excited to engage a national audience and welcome more than 400 people to this first ever virtual event. This year's lecture is co-sponsored by Creighton University's Division of Mission and Ministry, and I'm grateful to Vice Provost Eileen Burke Sullivan for her support. The 2020 U.S. general election is arguably one of the most consequential in American history. Our nation faces enormous challenges, an ongoing pandemic that's killed more than 220,000 Americans and 1.1 million persons worldwide, a national reckoning on racial injustice, and questions about the future of policies on immigration, abortion, and health care, to name just a few. Looming over all these is the climate crisis. As scientists warn, the next few years of policies will either limit post-industrial global warming near 1.5 degrees Celsius or catalyze exponential warming with feedback loops that could threaten billions of lives this century. Against this backdrop, Catholics are called to participate in politics and shape society according to essential values. Although politics includes all the activities that help structure society, including advocacy, debate, and nonviolent direct action, voting is an especially important activity. This action, as our speaker Dr. Caveney has written, calls Catholics to prudentially discern which candidates will best promote interconnected values and oppose disvalues that all cut across many different issues. At the heart of voting discernment is conscience, the capacity of each person to know and do the good. The Catholic tradition views conscience as sacred and inviolable. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church asserts, quote, a human being must always obey the certain judgment of her or his conscience, end quote. Certain judgment requires a person to undergo the process of moral discernment, which for Catholics entails prayerful consideration of experience, reason, scripture, and the tradition of the community, especially the bishops. In his apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis reiterates the traditional Catholic teaching that the bishops, quote, have been called to form consciences, not to replace them, end quote. To assist this formation, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops publishes Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship ahead of each U.S. presidential election. In it, the bishops communicate different levels of church teaching. As the theologian Richard Gallardi outlines, these include dogmas, doctrines, and prudential judgments. In conscience, Catholics owe different responses to each level of teaching. On one hand, forming consciences provides valuable pastoral direction to Catholics who seek to conscientiously discern their vote informed by church teaching. On the other hand, however, U.S. Catholics have critiqued some of the document's moral theology and prudential judgment. Others lament how some Catholics have interpreted parts of the text or overstated the authority of particular teachings within it. Especially considering the gravity of this year's election, the 2020 Marcoux de Poor Lecture convenes two leading Catholic thinkers to assess the current edition of Forming Consciences and help Catholics discern their votes informed by the fullness of faith, a concept from the book of that title by Michael and Kenneth Himes. Our first speaker is Most Reverend John E. Stowe, Bishop of Lexington, Kentucky. Bishop Stowe is a conventual Franciscan and was ordained to the priesthood in 1995. Prior to his Episcopal appointment, Bishop Stowe served as a pastor in Texas, moderator of the Curia, and eventually as chancellor for the Diocese of El Paso. 
In 2010, he was elected vicar provincial of the province of Our Lady of Consolation and became pastor and rector of the Basilica and National Shrine of Our Lady of Consolation in Cary, Ohio. Bishop Stowe earned a BA in philosophy and history from St. Louis University and both a master's in divinity and a licentiate in church history from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, California. He was appointed Bishop of Lexington by Pope Francis in 2015. Our second speaker is Kathleen Caveney, the Darrell and Juliet Libby Professor at Boston College, a position that includes appointments in both the Department of Theology and the Law School. A moral theologian and a lawyer, Dr. Caveney has published four books and over 100 articles and essays that explore the intersection of theology, ethics, and law. As her former student and dissertation advisee, I can attest to the profound impact of Dr. Caveney's work. Prior to Boston College, Dr. Caveney taught law and theology at the University of Notre Dame, served as a visiting professor at Princeton University, Yale University, and Georgetown University, and as a visiting scholar at the University of Chicago. Additionally, she is also past president of the Society of Christian Ethics. Before entering academia, Dr. Caveney clerked for the Honorable John T. Newton, Jr. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and worked as an associate at the Boston law firm of Ropes and Gray. Dr. Caveney earned both her Ph.D. in ethics and J.D. from Yale University. Tonight, Bishop Stowe and Dr. Caveney will each begin with an opening address. After these remarks, each will have the opportunity to respond to the other and discuss their insights. Following this discussion, we'll have a moderated Q&A session in which the presenters will respond to audience questions. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat box below. We won't be able to engage each question, but I'll work to synthesize the submissions and address as many themes as possible. And now, please join me in welcoming Bishop Stowe. Good, Dr. DeLeo. It's wonderful to be with you in this important Marco de Porres annual social justice lecture and I'm especially honored to be sharing this stage, as it were, with Dr. Cavini, who is a great uh, ethicist and theologian that has inspired us all. Um, in the September 17th issue of America, John Carr, who worked for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development for more than 20 years, and who directed the creation and promotion of a document from the American bishops on the significance of voting, tells us that the bishops have issued such a document in advance of the last 12 presidential elections. What began as a 3,000 word document before the presidential election of 1976, our nation's bicentennial year, has grown into a nearly 18,000 word booklet in advance of the current presidential election. The name and the content has also evolved from being a reflection on what faithful citizenship means for Catholics to reflecting Pope Benedict XVI's conception of the role of the church in political life, now titled Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. John Carr observes that the document in its many editions is the most widely used, misused, and abused statement of the U.S. Bishops Conference. He knows that it receives more attention than most other statements of the Bishops Conference but laments how it is cherry picked by partisans who can proof text the document to suit their political preferences. In its original version, the document described the bishop's aspirations in issuing such a guide. We hope that the voter will examine the positions of candidates on the full range of issues, as well as the person's integrity, philosophy, and performance, it said. Since the Bishops' Conference did not see fit to issue new documents for the current or the previous elections, but rather to situate updates on current issues into the document that has been in use since the election of 2012, I think it might have been a better choice to go back and update that original document on the full range of issues and the integrity, philosophy, and performance of the candidates which seems especially critical now. These quadrennial documents explore the nature of the church's role in public life. Should the church have something to say at all about politics and elections in a nation that prizes the separation of church and state? Many people, especially when they hear something with which they disagree from the pulpit or in a diocesan publication, 
fire off letters to the offending cleric or the local newspaper, or more likely these days, post a harshly worded statement on Facebook or Twitter insisting that the church stay out of politics. I myself have a small collection of copies of letters sent to the IRS claiming that I have violated federal law by speaking or writing about political issues. And actually, I prefer that, especially when it's accompanied with the text that I actually wrote, to the wild distortions and out of context manipulations of what was said that some so-called Catholic social media sites traffic in these days. It should be obvious that in the United States, there is no political party which fully embraces the teaching of the church. The statements from the Bishop's Conference always state in one way or another that the Catholic Church is not striving to create a voting bloc. Nonetheless, Catholics make up enough of the population that our voting trends are well studied and much observed in each presidential election season. Right now, pollsters are paying attention to what Catholics are saying about how they will vote, and they're tracking the answers according to the racial background of the Catholic respondents, noting major differences in the responses of white Catholics and of Catholics of color. Each of the faithful citizenship documents address what it is that Catholics should be bringing to the public square, that is, into public debate and discussion, into the attempts to influence policy and law, and into the voting booth, and how these are or could be quite valuable. Namely, we bring a consistent moral framework with both personal and social dimensions rooted in scripture and tradition. We are a large and diverse community that encompasses membership of both major political parties and several others, and a variety of racial, ethnic, social, and economic backgrounds. And we have substantial on the ground, hands on experience in education, health care, and social services through our membership and through the institutions we sponsor. With those gifts to be offered, the role of the church has both internal and external components in the political sphere. For the membership, it is vital that the church educate Catholics in the formation of consciences. That is what we should call remote preparation because it involves a lifetime of ongoing formation and reflection upon experience in the light of the teachings of Christ and his church. There is no way that the formation of consciences can be accomplished in a voter's guide, but it has to be part of the ongoing mission of the church, a church which is engaged in the public sphere, a church not locked in the sacristy. Pope Francis likes to say we should be a church that goes out, a church that is engaged in the world, a church that even gets bruised on the streets. The church is particularly equipped to emphasize the moral dimensions of public policies. For example, immigration, war and peace, the role of a police force in a society, how health care is distributed and obtained, services for the poor, the protection of the environment, and more. The church seeks to have a voice in the debate on matters affecting the common good and the dignity of the human person. And while our teachings are rooted in scripture and tradition, our role in the public square is to argue, not to impose, to argue how the consequences of those teachings contribute to the common good. The church recognizes and respects the plurality of U.S. society and acknowledges the value of the appropriate separation of church and state. Above and beyond these roles in education, the formation of consciences, highlighting the moral dimensions of policies and entering the debate, the church bears witness to our teachings through the activity of our members. We not only speak against abortion, but must provide assistance for alternatives. We are against discrimination towards immigrants and so we serve people without reference to their citizenship. We advocate for health care and services for the poor, and we must invest our own resources to provide those services as well. In the various editions of the Bishop's Statements on Voting, there's a helpful description of the characteristics of the church's role. To be principled, but not ideological. 
clear, but also civil, engaged, but not used. I'm afraid that these noble characteristics would not always meet the test of authenticity in practice. Principles give way to ideology when one party becomes closely aligned with church leadership because of certain priorities, while the same leadership overlooks or downplays major violations of Christian values in other policies. Clarity becomes incivility when people with differing viewpoints are not heard, are declared not worthy of being heard, or are labeled as not being true Catholics and thus dismissed. Being engaged has become more like being used most frequently, in my opinion, on the issue of abortion, which has forged an uncritical alignment with the Republican Party to the point that some Catholic leaders can willingly overlook the resumption of federal executions, the cruel policy of excluding refugees fleeing death and violence, the separation of immigrant families, despite court orders to cease, the elimination or reduction of social services, the curtailing of access to health care, the dismantling of policies designed to decrease carbon emissions, and the expansion of the extraction of fossil fuels and other issues because the party wants to work for the reversal of Roe v. Wade. In choosing not to revise the document in advance of the 2016 election, I think the bishops missed a significant opportunity not only to incorporate the teachings of Pope Francis, whose election in 2013 followed the previous US presidential election, but especially to further enflesh the message that Pope Francis brought personally to the United States in his 2015 visit. The first Pope ever to address the joint houses of the US Congress had a powerful message for the country. His deliberate choice to arrive in the United States en route from Cuba was a significant gesture about dialogue in global relations. His address at Liberty Hall in Philadelphia, as well as at the White House, emphasized how the Catholic Church has always been a church of immigrants in this country. He told the representatives and senators, quote, you are called to defend and preserve the dignity of your fellow citizens in the tireless and demanding pursuit of the common good, for this is the chief aim of all politics. He talked about the concerns of working men and women, about how the contributions of the elderly are not always valued as they should be. He warned against the simplistic reduction of peoples and nations into good and evil, and he called for hope and healing, for peace and justice. Francis celebrated the accomplishments of the United States when it has extended its spirit of fraternity and solidarity far beyond our shores. He celebrated the religious pluralism and the longstanding commitment to democracy, something that might be at risk at this moment. He said then, well in advance of Fratelli Tutti, that politics cannot be a slave to the economy and finance. He described politics as, quote, an expression of our compelling need to live as one in order to build as one the greatest common good, that of a community which sacrifices particular interests in order to share in justice and peace, its goods, its interests, its social life. Wouldn't that have been rich food for thought in the formation of consciences for faithful citizenship? The Pope respectfully described our failures to live our own values as a nation. The death penalty, people trapped in cycles of poverty, the great disparity in the creation and the distribution of wealth, engagement in war and what he termed the blood money made from the sale of deadly weapons across the world and the guns on our streets, disrespect for native peoples, hostility to migrants, failures in the formation of the family and protection of the vulnerable. Illustrated with the examples of a president, a monk, the founder of the Catholic worker movement and the leader of the civil rights movement, the Pope called the United States to live out its own highest ideals as the land which has invited so many people around the world to dream. 
I hardly need to say that so much has happened since the election of 2016. And again, the Conference of Bishops saw no reason to write a new document for the consequential election of 2020. Instead, the argument was made that people no longer read documents and the emphasis should be on the production of videos which can be shared through social media. Some of those videos were quite good, but how many have even seen them? And the old 2012 election document was issued once again with a new introductory letter and another opportunity was missed. Although the 2020 faithful citizenship document was approved long before the onset of the pandemic, the ugly resurgence of nationalism and white supremacy was already on the rise and the civility of public discourse had been in drastic decline. It's not hard to draw connections in either case to the words and actions of the current president. In the latest document, it's hard to find either the inspiring and well-received call to community issued by the Holy Father on his visit, or the call to form an appropriate response to the alarming disdain for human dignity on display from a president who would use vulgar language in public discourse to describe women, to describe immigrants, to describe the nations from which black refugees come. The introductory letter to the current forming consciences, the new part, acknowledges that Pope Francis calls the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned and the underprivileged, the vulnerable, infirm and elderly exposed to convert to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking and new forms of slavery and every form of rejection equally sacred, equally sacred to the innocent unborn who require a firm and passionate defense. But nothing else in the introductory letter or in the document itself comes close to describing these other victims or their cause as being equally sacred. A single paragraph describes the separation, inhumane treatment, and lack of due process at the border, as well as the resistance to receiving refugees seeking asylum, the danger experienced by those living with temporary protected status, and the dreamers, all of which is to be addressed, according to the bishops, while assuring the security of our citizens. A single sentence in the letter describes the festering wound of racism, quote, an important topic. In that same paragraph, we find the issues of religious freedom at home and abroad on federal and state levels, global peace and families who struggle, xenophobia, capital punishment, and other issues that affect human life and dignity, affirming the nature of human beings as male and female, protecting the family based on marriage between a man and a woman, upholding the rights of children, finding ways to better care for God's creation, especially those most impacted by climate change, protecting our common home, resisting the throwaway culture, and seeking integral development for all. Phew. All of this, of course, preceded by the statement, the threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself. Unlike refusing asylum to those seeking refuge, unlike capital punishment, unlike starvation and underdevelopment, unlike weapons sold at home and abroad. The introduction to the document itself reasserts the role of the church in the political order as in previous documents, emphasizing the formation of conscience of the church's own membership. It highlights four principles of social doctrine, the dignity of the human person, the common good, subsidiarity, and solidarity. It states that, quote, we bishops do not intend to tell Catholics for whom or against whom to vote, end of quote. And also says, quote, the particular judgments of the document may fall at various points along the political spectrum, but the foundational principles that guide these teachings should not be ignored in any case nor used selectively to serve partisan interests, which of course has not stopped some organizations from doing just that. While insisting once again that in the Catholic tradition, responsible citizenship is a virtue and participation in political life is a moral obligation, 
The document goes on to distinguish how political participation differs for laymen, that's the word used, for bishops and for pastors. It describes, it defines both conscience and what constitutes a well-formed conscience. It describes the virtue of prudence and states that a good end does not justify an immoral means. It presents the basics of ethics, doing good and avoiding evil, and employs the language of intrinsically evil acts, acts which cannot be justified in any circumstances. It then goes about talking about how one makes moral choices. Paragraph 42 says clearly, as Catholics, we are not single issue voters. A candidate's position on a single issue is not sufficient to guarantee a voter's support. But then continues to say, if a candidate's position on a single issue promotes an intrinsically evil act, such as legal abortion, redefining marriage in a way that denies its essential meaning or racist behavior, not racist language, interestingly, a voter may legitimately disqualify a candidate from receiving support. I've long summarized these political responsibility documents as saying, in essence, don't be a single issue voter, but the only issue that matters is abortion. There is a part two to the document summarizing USCCB policy positions on human life, promoting peace, marriage and family life, religious freedom, preferential option for the poor and economic justice, healthcare, migration, Catholic education, promoting justice and countering violence, combating unjust discrimination, 80 words for that, care for our common home, communication, media and culture, and global solidarity. But apart from the brief introductory letter, nothing in the document suggests how these issues apply to the current election, much less how the office is being contested might be impacted or what role they might play in affecting policies which express these positions. Finally, there's a list of nine goals for political life issued for citizens, candidates, and public officials alike. As a whole, they are as general and comprehensive as the last goal on the list, quote, join with others around the world to pursue peace, protect human rights and religious liberty, and advance economic justice and care for creation. That's one. Two weeks away from election day, I'm not sure how much attention this document has received. I am certain that the priests who have preached it is a moral sin to vote for Joe Biden, the bishops who have insisted on the narrowest interpretation of abortion being the preeminent priority in this election, and the rare exception who insists that there is more to consider in this election, such as the character of the candidates, gain far more attention than this teaching document. My own recommendation for prayerfully discerning one's vote would be a careful reading of Pope Francis' latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, where he laments the current situation in which we have failed to address the global pandemic with the awareness that it affects us all with no regard for national boundaries and in which he envisions a true concern for the common good within a different kind of politics, a politics that makes room for everyone, not just the right kind of Catholics, to pursue a more fraternal world. He invites us to build bridges instead of walls and to learn how to become a neighbor from the Good Samaritan. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Stowe. And now, Dr. Kathy Caveney from Boston College. And you are muted. There, how am I yeah. now, better? Okay. Good. I'll just start again. Thank you very much, Professor DeLeo and uh, Creighton University for the honor of participating in this esteemed lecture series. And I, I want to thank Bishop Stowe um, for his remarks, which were tremendous, really tremendous in terms of their ability to combine incisive uh, analysis, frank criticism of faithful citizenship and, 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 a, and a prophetic call to all of us as Catholics and citizens to, to, to take our responsibilities uh, for the common good 
very seriously over the next two weeks. Um, I'm afraid my talk is going to be a lot more prosaic. You have reached the soaring heights of, uh, uh, and really touched hearts about what it is that Catholic social teaching offers. I'm going to give a little bit more of a, of a nuts and bolts analysis of, of, of something very basic that I think that might be very important in terms of implementing what you say, which is an analysis of what we do when we vote. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm going to take it on that level. And I'd like to hope, Bishop and, and, and Professor DeLeo, that between the two of us, we will have covered the waterfront from you know, the ecology and the economy of, of, of the topic today, from the soaring heights and the inspiration to you know, some of the, of, of, of the blades of grass that we have to consider when we're going about uh, looking at this economy of, uh, of the election and citizenship and our Catholic tradition. So what I'd like to do now is actually share my screen. Let's see if we can do that. Because I actually have a PowerPoint. All right, let me move the people up here. Can you all see the, the PowerPoint? Is that working? Uh, yep. OK, great. Yep, we can do that. So what I'd like to do is talk about how we implement the vision that the bishop just described to us so beautifully. How do we think about voting, not simply as something you do, not simply as a, as a, as a reluctant obligation, but as a moral act that we need to take seriously um, as a member of a, a democratic republic, as somebody who is as a member of a democratic republic, both in some ways a sovereign, because it's we, the people, who are electing our leaders, but we're also subjects. We're subject to, um, to uh, the leaders that we elect. How do we think about our obligations? The bishop gave a, a wonderful overview of Catholic social teaching. Um, I'm going to just kind of reiterate uh, um, seven of those principles. I guess I've got a six and a seven there twice. Um, in a nutshell, the life and dignity of the human person. All people are sacred. They're all made in, in the image of God, especially those who are overlooked by society. Pope Francis calls us the throwaway culture, the people who are overlooked because of their age, their poverty, their disability. A call to family, community, and participation. We are not meant to be isolated individuals. We are meant to be relational. We are meant to be in communities and in all sorts of communities that have various members that crisscross in their membership. We need to think about rights and responsibility. It's not enough, in my view, for example, to talk about our right to religious freedom. It's also important to talk about what we owe other people who think differently than we do, for example, about their rights of religious freedom and what we owe them. The option for the poor and the vulnerable, the dignity of work and the rights of workers. I think that's an essential thing to think about in our current context when so many people because of COVID are suffering because their workplaces have been shut down or their lines of business have been uh, shrunken. Solidarity, what Pope John Paul II called the firm sense that we're all really responsible for all and care for God's creation. We can see this in the coronavirus. We can see this in climate change. We see the interconnectedness of everything from viruses to people. This is, I think, an, a, a, the connectedness of creation is something that is all, um, you know, all over everything that Pope Francis writes. So those are the elements, the seven elements of Catholic social teaching in a nutshell. But we're missing something, right? I like to call it the forest and the trees problem. We've got those seven elements. 
some people have four elements. I've seen lists of 10. If you really want the whole picture, you can go to the compendium of Catholic social teaching or the catechism. And you have all of these little elements of Catholic social teaching. You've got the trees, but what brings it together into a forest? What do we use to unite it, to organize it, to make it work as a, a, a living ecosystem? The ground and the goal of Catholic social teaching, as the bishop pointed out, is the common good. And I think it's important to see it both as the ground as in it is what generates these seven principles, but it's also the goal. It's what coordinates them. It was, it's what orders them. It what allows you to make difficult choices under difficult circumstances. What is the common good? What's well, a notoriously difficult concept to pin down, but the most common definition is from Pope John the 23rd in Mater and Magistra, uh, the sum total of social conditions which allow people either as groups or as individuals to reach their fulfillment more fully and easily. So it's about allowing individuals to flourish. It's about allowing groups to flourish. And I think it's also about allowing people to contribute to the flourishing of groups because we know that individuals, we know that human persons don't flourish just by gathering stuff from me and mine, but by making a contribution according to their vocation to the flourishing of other people. And as I just indicated, I think the common good needs to be reintroduced, not simply as an abstract concept, but really as the impetus for integrating and ordering the various components of Catholic social teaching and particularly um, the various issues that are ranked when we get to the, you know, the voting guides issued by the bishops. Which brings me in a way to my first criticism really of the bishop's guide. I'm being a little, uh, little bit more flippant than the, than the bishop was, but one way of thinking of what happened to this committee document over, you know, um, 24, 44 years is sort of middle-aged spread, right? And uh, John Carr talked about this a little bit in much nicer terms in the America article. We started out with the first Bishop's Guide in 1976. It was called Political Responsibility, uh, Reflections on an Election Year. And as the Bishop pointed out, it was only about 3,000 words. It was a nice, short, piece of prose. It was very clearly written and you could read it in one sitting. It identified eight issues in alphabetical order, abortion, economy, food policy, housing, human rights, mass media, military expenditures. There was no ranking of the issues and it had a single author, John Carr. Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship was a different document. Um, it, it took over, as the bishop said, uh, a bit later. You know, the first one was for the 2008 election. And over time, it has grown and grown and grown. It's identified about 18,000, used 18,000 18, words to identify over 50 issues and sub issues. And as the bishop pointed out uh, so well in his talk, We've got a confusing set of uh, rankings there. On the one hand, abortion is the preeminent issue, but we're also told we can't be a, pre a single issue voter. On the one hand, abortion is talked about again and again with obvious um, emotional and uh, intellectual commitment, um, but other issues are mentioned. It, it reads very much like what it is, a committee document where there are sentences that can be put in to satisfy each constituency, you get an overall sense of where it's going. But on the other hand, um, it doesn't necessarily give you any clear path forward. Um, so the guide itself, I think, has grown beyond um, its function. It's grown beyond its, its, um, 
it's grown beyond its uh, its mission. It's very hard to figure out what to do with it, even if you do manage to sit down and read 18,000 words. Um, so how do we think about some of the foundational issues in faithful citizenship and about faithful citizenship? Should the Bishops' Conference decide that, you know, 2020 should be the last iteration of this particular document, and maybe that for 2024, it might be time to write a, a new document for a new era. Here are some of my thoughts on the matter. First, I think we've got an issue or a lot of issues with issues. The, bish the bishop's guide, because they can't necessarily, they can't tell you how to vote, are trying to tell you what issues you should consider when you're voting. But that's part of the problem, isn't it? Because an issue is almost a grab bag term. What is it? It can refer to a complex problem with many causes, like hunger, global warming, illegal immigration. It can refer to an entire section of social life. The issue this election is the economy, somebody might say. That's a whole section of the social life. That's not a particular problem. You can say that it refers to a morally objectionable practice, such as abortion or illegal drug use. You can say an issue is a particular legislative proposal, say a, a, a bill authorizing same-sex marriage or banning capital punishment. Is that an issue? Well, maybe, but it's not an issue in the same way hunger or the economy or abortion are an issue. An issue can refer to a term like a Middle East strategy. That's a complex policy. That's not a legislative proposal. And an issue can refer to a fundamental value running throughout law and, and society, such as free exercise of religion. So when we think about issues, one of the reasons we're so confused, especially as they multiply, is that they're not all the same thing and they don't point us all in the same direction when it comes to analyzing them. So that's one issue with issues. A second issue with issues is that even if you set aside everything I just talked about, there's a, there's a fundamental divergence that I think every voter needs to consider. And that's kind of a, a distinction between important issues on the one hand and urgent issues on the other. If you look at the house on the left, that's got an important issue. That foundation is sinking. That house is just being sucked into the ground. It's the foundation is crumbling. You have to shore up the foundation of that house if you're going to be able to live with it or live with it or live in it even. So it's, it's an important issue. But then if you look at the house on the right, it's got an urgent issue. The roof is on fire. The garage, it looks like, actually. So the house's roof is on fire. You have to fix that first. So it's not necessarily that a roof in the abstract is more important than a foundation in the abstract. But if we're talking about the same house, if you don't get that fire under control, there's going to be no point in shoring up the foundation of it because you're just going to be shoring up the foundation of ashes and cinders. And I think part of what voters are grappling with um, in, in many elections, such as the 2007-2008 election, is how do you think about important issues versus urgent issues? When the economy was tanking in 2007-2008, I think people thought, if we don't get this economy under control very soon, we are not going to have the, the basis, just the sheer... Uh, kind of capacity to interact with each other, to feed uh, people, to, to, to get the energy to go around and address all of the other important issues. You have to put out the fire in the roof 
before you attend to the foundation. On the other hand, all sorts of time management um, issues have told us and told us and told us. And I think we know this in our own lives. It's really easy to keep putting, up, putting off important issues because you see issues as more urgent at a particular point in time. So you have to think about how do we balance important versus urgent at a particular time and place? And this does require the virtue of prudence. Prudence is, um, as the bishop uh, also noted, right reason about things to be done. What, what do we do? It's a virtue. It requires you to think carefully, to consider many factors, but it's also time and place sensitive because it's about contingent uh, factors. So I think everyone in the context of an election has to discern not just what are the important issues or what are the urgent issues, but how do we deal with the most urgent issues while also making progress on important issues. And a third issue with or issues, I think in any election is you have to expect the unexpected. When we were thinking about electing President George W. Bush in the 2000 election, who could have seen that his presidency would have been dominated by dealing with the threat of terrorism after the 9-11 attacks. President Barack Obama, he was occupied dealing with the Great Recession. We didn't see it, maybe we should have, maybe the bankers should have, maybe the regulators should have, but we didn't see it. And of course, pre President Donald Trump, his, you know, the past year has been consumed with the coronavirus. So part of thinking about issues is no voter's guide that's written a year before we're, uh, we're up for an election, much less 10 years before and lightly updated in a preface can think about everything that's going to be really important to, to, the, um, you know, to the president uh, who we are actually electing. So I want to start again. I want to set issues to the side for a minute and get back to fundamentals. Well, one type of fundamentals, voting. What the voting guides are about is the election. And it's about the fact that most of us, if we're over 18, are going to be voting. Fundamental question is, do we have an obligation to vote? And I would say yes on this. I would like to say it's a role related obligation of being a citizen in a representative democracy. It's part of your job, it's part of your vocation, it's part of your call. You have things you have to do because you're a parent, you have things you have to do because you're a child, you didn't necessarily choose them all, especially, you know, we have role related obligations that are not part of a package that we choose, but they're part of our identity. And I'd like to say that being a, a citizen brings with it the obligation to vote. Now, some people, including some Catholics and even perhaps some bishops say, oh no, I don't have to vote. Voting is going to bring me in touch or too close contact with evil because no matter who I vote for, my vote is going to contribute to an election. That election is going to contribute then to them doing some things and those things may be bad and I am just better off keeping myself entirely pure and therefore out of the voting booth. I'd like to propose that that's a, not a correct analysis. Lots of ethicists have said, well, we can use cooperation with evil and say it's justified. It's what's technical term is called remote material cooperation justified by proportionate reason. But saying, oh, we'll do a cooperation with evil analysis and 
and and and it'll be okay. Um, I'm a little even more radical on that point and say no. Actually, looking at voting in terms of cooperation with evil is actually a mistaken use of the category, uh, because. If you look at how the category is, is used in the tradition, and in my own view, more importantly, how it should be used, you have role-related obligations that block the invocation of cooperation with evil. And if we didn't have those role-related obligations, um, we, we would be in somewhat of a pickle as a society. So you don't want the emergency room nurse, right, um, saying, when somebody's brought in, like a gangster is brought in, you know, I could stem the bleeding on his artery, but you know, if I stem the bleeding on his artery, he's probably going to get better and then he's going to go back out and there's going to be some sort of a gang warfare and I'm going to be cooperating with the evil he does. No, under some uh, situations, the cooperation with evil analysis is blocked and you do your job. And I think that the voting as best you can, at least if you're in a fair election, I'll give you that, is an obligation of being a citizen and a representative democracy. What do you do with you when you vote? The first thing, and I think the most important thing, is you participate in the democratic process. It's something that you do that has weight even if it doesn't make a difference in terms of you cast the decisive vote. It's important that you're there and that you assume the obligation. A second thing you can do is selective. You're picking somebody to be the president, to be the governor, to be the senator, to be on the, on the town council. You're selecting leadership. And the third thing you can do and I think is done often, but maybe not as often as, as some people think, is expressive. Sometimes you're not so much selecting a particular person, but you're saying not this. Under no circumstances do I wanna do this. So I almost think that if you have a big problem with the candidates, you're better off voting and writing in, in somebody that you think would be better, even if they don't have a chance of winning in the sense of that's at least participatory and you're expressing your views about what's good for our democratic republic or your town or um, your state. So that's what we do when we vote. Here's another thing to think about, I think if we're thinking about what we do when we vote. We've been mesmerized when looking at these voting guides by issues. But as Bishop McElroy pointed out, as John Carr has pointed out as well, if you think about what we do, unless you're voting on a referendum, you vote for candidates, not issues. You're voting for people. So you have to focus on what it is you're doing and ask which candidate is the best person for this job. And I think it involves four sets of criteria, all beginning with the letter C. I don't quite know why, but I feel like it's a little bit like a Sesame Street thing. This slide is brought to you, brought to you by the letter C. So here are my four Cs. Competence. Does the candidate have the intellectual capacity, the experience, the temperament and the judgment to do the job. So competence is really about, can they do this? It's not about character. Character is the second criterion. Do they have a good set of moral values? Do they appreciate the components of Catholic social teaching and the integrity to pursue them in situations of temptation and fear? It's not whether they're gonna check the right box you know, sitting at home on a multiple choice, you know, Catholic social teaching uh, values test. It's whether they're going to stand up and implement that under situations that politicians often face of temptation to promote their own good or fear of being uh, pressured. Character and competence have to be assessed separately. And I think you need a floor level for both. 
there's going to be trade-offs, but you're not going to have, I mean, for example, you know, Mother Teresa, one of the most wonderful and, and admire uh, and, and people worthy of admiration um, in the world, a saint, you know, you, she probably totally blows the character criterion out of water. But if she's running for president of the United States, even if she were a citizen, maybe not the background, maybe not the experience, maybe not the moving up through the managing uh, other types of government. You need both competence and character. Two other factors I think matter. Collaboration. Politicians aren't working on their own. Can the candidate work well with other people, both political allies and opponents? You know, in the case of uh, Donald Trump, I think one fair thing to look at is how, what kind of people has he brought in? Who has he rewarded? Who he, has he fired? Who has, who have quit and why? How do you work with other people? And I think you can ask the same thing about Biden. And connections is the final C. What are the moral and practical ramifications of the candidate's political and financial connections for the manner in which he or she will carry out the job? Politicians do not act alone. And I think we need to pay more attention to this. They take their places within networks of political power, including party affiliations, lobbyists, and big corporate and individual donors. for a minute about character. I'd love to see the next iteration of the voting guide. Think about the qualities of a virtuous politician. And, and I'd like to put in a little kind of caveat here. When people talk about the virtuous politician, it sounds like you've got somebody who is sort of like the goody two shoes maybe, right? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and somebody maybe who was the hall room monitor in third grade, the last people, you know, you really want running anything and, you know, you're not even sure you want to see them at your class reunion, right? That's not what I mean by virtue. Virtue actually talks about strengths. It talks about character. It talks about what makes a person fully themselves, but also fully open to other people. And in the broad Christian tradition, Adopting from the Greek tradition, Aristotle, we've got four big virtues, four cardinal virtues. Prudence is the, the character uh, of the person we're thinking of electing, demonstrating the virtue of prudence, which isn't just, well, I'm going to do the narrow, short-minded, uh, short-sighted thing, but really is, do you have a big vision? Do you seek a wide range of advice? Do you evaluate that advice? And do you make sound de decisions? Justice. Is this person just concerned with him and his or her and hers? Or am I just concerned with me and mine? But are they really concerned with the well-being of all, including political opponents, those who didn't vote for them, and especially the least among us? So many of Catholic social teachings foci um, uh, especially in the issues and in the, even in the, you know, the four principles or seven principles or 10 principles of Catholic social teaching are really concerned with justice. Temperance. Does the candidate's desire for money, fame, and power override everything or is it held in check? And fortitude. Is this person neither overly fearful nor overly rash? Are they neither overly desirous of avoiding confrontation or are they too eager to have confrontations? I like to think, see us talking as Catholics about what the virtues of politicians are, what their vices are, and actually talking about some of the trade-offs. What would be ideal? What's good enough? What is something that's a deal breaker, not in terms of issues, but maybe in terms of character? Now, finally, having said all that, I'd like to get back for a couple of minutes to issues. 
how do we think about the relationship of candidates and issues? What worries me a lot about the, you know, the voting guides as they've come out under faithful citizenship is they almost think it's like a magical relationship, right? A candidate has a stance on an issue. And if that's a stance, that's it, or her stance. We just look at the candidate, what they say on the issue, and that ends the inquiry. I think it's just the first step of a many step process. What exactly is a stance on an issue? Well, it can be a judgment that a particular situation poses a problem for the common good. That would be one way of thinking about it. It's a view about what has caused the situation and it's a proposal to remedy the situation. And you may agree or disagree at different points down that three point chain. You may agree that a, a judgment, uh, with the judgment that a particular situation poses a problem for the common good, you may have a different view about what caused it. And you may have a different view about how to remedy it. Dif disagreements on points two and three may involve good faith or bad faith. They may involve paying attention to uh, you know, different experts. If you think about the, the, the fights that went on at the cabinet level about how to address you know, the economic crisis of 2007, you know, everybody agreed it was a crisis. They had different views about what caused it, though eventually people came to the idea that it was the, uh, the really shaky mortgages. And there were lots of fights about how to remedy it. Another thing we need to ask is why are a candidate stand on issues important? I think there are two reasons. One is you want the candidate to be able to do something about it. But what about if the candidate isn't in a position to do something about it? For example, you may think peace in the Middle East is an extraordinarily important issue. But maybe that's not the issue that you're really going to judge the election to your school board on the basis of, right? The school board and the Middle East have a lot of space between them. And then secondly, you might say they reveal something about the candidate's character. If they don't have the right stand on an issue, they might have a defective character because they're not caring about the right things. They may not see that a particular situation poses a problem for the common good because they don't care about that aspect of the common good. That's true, but we have to be very careful that we don't take the judgment about character down to the second and third points of a candidate's stance on an issue. People can think that a particular problem really is a problem for the common good, but have different views about how to address it. They may be wrong and you may not want to elect them because you think that they're entirely wrong headed, but they may not be bad people. They may not be morally flawed people who don't care about the common good. So one of the things I don't like about the total focus on issues is that by focusing only on issues and by failing to see how complicated they are, it's really easy to demonize candidates we don't like or even people who are voting for candidates we don't like. And I don't think that helps the church either. Well, I'm almost out of time. So I'm just gonna end with a request. Remember to vote. Voting is the way you can make a difference, not necessarily by yourself, but with everyone else who is also a sovereign and a subject in this country of ours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaveny. Um, before we get to questions, and we've got several of them already, and I've been trying to synthesize themes as uh, as much as I'm able, um, I wanted to give both of you an opportunity to respond to the other. Um, you all, as as Dr. Kaveny said, um, have approached the topic of forming consciences from different perspectives, one pastoral, um, one more academic, one um, more overarching, one more um, nuts and bolts. And so I wanted to, to provide an opportunity, um, maybe Bishop's 
Augusto, if, if you have some thoughts um, initially in response to what Dr. Kavanagh was saying, um, give you a, a space to, to share some initial reflections um, if you'd like. Sure. Um, I'm remembering when you first asked me about participating in this discussion and I said, I can't debate Dr. Kaveny, that's impossible. Uh, now I see why even more so. It, it was an excellent presentation that really gets at the heart of so much of the challenge in this particular election as well as in an overall way. In, in my experience with community organizing on the local level, we found that most of the people running for office, again, especially on the local level, were interested in endorsements and money. <laughs> And if you're working with a low income community and for a church, you can provide neither endorsements nor money. So we had to bring people together in a forum that would address issues and really help the people to understand that they were their issues that they were presenting. And that's what they were concerned about. As we get farther removed from that local scene, and especially when we're talking about a national picture as we are in this, election and what the bishops address in their document, I'm really intrigued by um, your suggestion that we move more to looking at the candidates and provide guidance for discerning which is, to, which is the better candidate and not just about issues. Um, I think the, the rationale is, is for the bishops is the tax exemption status of the churches and the prohibition for endorsing particular candidates. However, what you're suggesting does not involve endorsement. It involves giving the criteria for discerning the character, the competence, the, the, the ability to work with others, etc. I, I think it's a, it's a very helpful uh, analogy. How would, how would a voter's guide look like if this were the, the content and the thrust of it? Well, um, I think that it, th that's a hard question, but I think we can talk about political virtues without violating, or, or the virtues of politicians without violating, um, you know, the IRS laws. And I think one of the analogies where we could look is we, we've got lots of helpful lists of characteristics for other kinds of vocations. For example, medical ethics has got you know, has developed in virtue theory. Virtue theory has been very prominent in Christian ethics, as Professor DeLeo knows, over the past, say, 30 years. But what are the virtues of a good doctor? What are the virtues of a good parent? What are the virtues of a, of a good lawyer? You know, so thinking in those broader terms, I think it would be, would be helpful to maybe even pull together a group of Catholic politicians and other politicians of goodwill and say, okay, what do you think the people who do what you do best, and by best, we don't mean getting elected four million times, um, but we mean really serving the common good. What are their characteristics? Um, and, and, and maybe kind of do it a little bit, you know, from the ground up. Uh, I think that that would help um, some. Uh, at least that's what I'm hoping, uh, because I, I, I think the problem is if you just vote on issues, and in here, in here I'll give us, I mean, my goal, I'm, I'm here as a teacher, you know, and so as a teacher, I don't want to tell people how to vote, but, you know, one of the things in this election, I think you can say uncontroversially, is we have two gentlemen that are are a little bit older in a position where they're going to be taking on responsibility for, you know, kind of leading the free world. How, how do you think about that character, you know, that, that, that aspect of them? So competence isn't simply, you know, what their mind is at a particular point in time. It's also asking, do I think they're going to have you know, the ability to carry out their job over the next four years? Or do I think that, you know, they're going to put in place people who are going to help them? Do I think their running mate is, is someone who's in a position to step in? All of those are issues that are, are both practical, but in, in a Thomistic framework, they're, they're moral too, because they pertain to the common good. I have a 
question to ask you, Bishop Stowe, to just turn the tables a minute, because I was so, uh, you know, inspired by your presentation. And, and so I'd like to ask you about something that's not so inspiring. To what degree do you think the divisions in this country or in the church are, attib are attributable to say Catholic Twitter? You know, because when you go into a church, when you go into, you know, even people that I know who disagree with me politically, you know, and I see them, you know, dragging themselves into church, even though it's hard and, and they're a little afraid and, you know, of, of, you know, but they're socially distancing or really making an effort to sew up, show up for the soup kitchen. I don't just see them as somebody who disagrees with me as politically. I see them as a beloved child of God who I wish would get their head on straight on a couple of things, but really, you know, I see the goodness in them. And when you get on Catholic Twitter, it's just so full of hate. You know, uh, maybe before we revise the the bishop, uh, the, the voting guide, we need to revise the, you know, we need a guide for Twitter. For sure. You know, the Bishop's Conference did put out a, a brief thing about the guide for civility and, and a call for civility, even a pledge that people could take to be civil in this election. But, you know, Pope Francis says in a number of places that you can't, he always promotes the culture of encounter. And, and what you're describing about somebody you disagree with, but you could see the goodness in that person is because there's been an encounter. Right. And, and he says, you can't have a real encounter when there's an on and off switch. You know, we can't have real encounters through our electronic devices, even though we're, we're doing our best um, in these kind of forum right now. But be, the problem with Twitter and things like that is, is you can just say your worst thoughts without any filter and put them out there or make up facts because everybody else is making up facts and, and distortions and, and trying to get attention. And yeah, it, it, it really, it's not dialogue. It's not discourse that we have, and it, it's not what Pope Francis calls the encounter. So it, it is a real problem, and, and the divisions in the church are, are certainly uh, enhanced by, by the Twitter wars that go on. So you can get into debates about liturgy and all kinds of extremes in the liturgical and the moral frame and social justice and, and political, anywhere you want to go. No, but, and I, I mean, I, I never thought I'd be, uh, to some degree, I used to blog for Commonweal and there were comments on the Commonweal blog and you know people like, well, this is really not very civil. What's going on here? I never thought I'd be nostalgic for the <laughs> civility of the blog. Um, right. Right. You know, in an era where there's the, you know, the Twitterverse makes the blog look like, you know, high tea at Buckingham Palace or something. You know, it's it's and and, and it is the debate, but I also worry about the this is a word I've just invented. Well, I haven't just invented it. I invented it a, a while ago. We all know the word event. We're supposed to be evangelists, right? Evangelists. And, and the Greek, you know, I mean, means a good message, good news, right? That's what the gospel is, good news. Well, there's another prefix that my friends who know Greek tell me could go before that word. And it's, you could have somebody be a cuckangelist. So the prefix is kaka, which means bad <laughs> news. And, 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 you know, and I, I sometimes really wonder if, if the Twitter universe is, is, a, is a, uh, you know, a concatenation of cacangelization, not evangelization. Um, and so it's not just the politics, it's the underlying moral message, the, the vision of humanity that's, I think, at stake in the way we're discussing these things now on, on the internet. And, and it goes back to the issue of character, which you presented here, and, and without trying to be especially partisan about it, you can't help when the, the chief leader in the country uses such vulgarities and uses the, that social media as a way to be destructive towards other people and put them down. It's not surprising that it finds its way throughout the culture. Now, he didn't do that, and he's not the only one to do it, but it's... He kind of gives permission in lots of ways for that kind of destructive. I think that that's right. And, and, but I also think there's a lacuna in our training. And, you know, we focus on content. You know, what is somebody saying? We just assumed that civility was there. Um, 
and we haven't thought about kind of how we deal with different kinds of rhetoric really you know so how do you effectively deal with somebody who's decided they're going to imitate our current president on twitter you know wh what is the appropriate way to deal with somebody in that mode um do you just ignore them do you um do you engage them because I, what i see is this whole lack of civility is it, and really these Catholic fights are turning off a whole generation of younger Catholics, not only from mm -hmm. politics, but also from mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and doesn't that also go back to the common good? I think it's a consequence yeah. of this kind of extreme individualism that, you know, that my view is so important and anybody that doesn't agree with it is so stupid or so inconsequential that I can say whatever I want. Right. And I think about some different cultures that, that are also at home here in the United States now and how important family is and how important a communitarian ethic is. And in those contexts, you find that uh, politeness is so much more important. And I, and I, hope, I hope they don't lose that in the, in the electronic and social media. No, I think that that's important. We've got lots of questions, um, so I do want to uh, provide some some time and some space for some uh, for some interaction. Um, and as I said, we're not we're not going to be able to get to everything, but I, I'm trying to synthesize themes. Um, and one of the themes that I think has come up uh, certainly in your work, Dr. Caveney, but um, throughout tonight are, are um, the complexities of voting. And we've talked about candidates, we've talked about issues. Um, but this question is about what underpins candidates and issues, and that's about values. And so the question says that even before candidates and issues, voting seeks to promote values and oppose disvalues. How can we help Catholics recognize that values transcend issues and no issue has a monopoly on a value? So I guess a question for either one of you. Do you want to start, Bishop? Uh, I'll let the ethicist start here. <laughs> the ethicist was trying to, that's a, such a hard question. Well, I think that what you start with, when you think about values versus issues, I mean, my mind is immediately taken to Pope Francis and Laudato Si and the notion that everything is connected, right? So what a value does is say, all right, on one level, how you treat the unborn and how you, um, you know, abortion is one issue and immigration is another issue. But you, you talked about this so well, Bishop, in your talk. Um, but really what you're talking about is how do we treat the least, uh, the most vulnerable members of the family, of the human family, and that there, there's a concern for vulnerability that's at stake there. I think what's what's important when we talk about values is that it can also kind of critique being concerned, you know, or critique wrong ways of, of being concerned about a particular issue. So say with abortion, I think it's important to be concerned with the life of the unborn because they're members of the human family and every member of the human family is made in the image and likeness of God. I think, and I'm not saying anybody does this, but if somebody did think that the unborn were valuable because they were, you know, they, they were brand new and innocent and, and they had never done anything wrong and, you know, and they were cute, they were a little and cute, that would be the wrong reason to value the unborn. Their value doesn't depend upon their being little and cute, their value depends upon their being members of the human family. And so the not little and the not cute, the immigrant and the aged are equally valuable. So what values do, I think, is allow you to see issues in the right perspective. Otherwise, um, I think you could, uh, you know, you could have the, the, the wrong sense of why an issue matters. The economy, well, why does the economy matter? Well, if you think it's just the economy, you can say, well, the economy matters because I really need to have my second house and my motorboat and, you know, my spaceship to Mars because, you know, I got to get out of here soon. Well, yeah, it's good, you know, 
that's that's possible if you think about the economy in the abstract but if the value is human flourishing and ability to have what you need in order to contribute back to the society that blocks the wrong interpretation of the value i think it's harder to determine what somebody's values are we, either you take them at, at what they say and you know listen to c-span you'll hear all kinds of politicians espouse all kinds of values that don't match their voting record and don't match uh, their lifestyle necessarily. Um, but there are some that are, are genuine and, and it, it brings the, the point right back to character again. I think it's the character that reveals the, the values of the person. And, you know, my Irish and suspicious relatives would say, you know, you don't have to, and I didn't mean that as a slur, I'm just thinking about them, like, well, you don't have to take people at face value, we don't really, you know, I mean, just because somebody says that's their value doesn't mean that that's their value. It may mean that they're saying this strategically. You know, mm -hmm. you don't expect all politicians to lie, but you shouldn't be shocked, you know, shocked if one or two of them are not acting in accordance with what they're saying. So I think getting a sense of how do you decide if somebody's trying to play you is an important thing as well. Um, well, another question that, again, in terms of common themes that has come up is this um, attention to preeminent, the language of preeminence in forming consciences. Um, and there's a question that kind of brings it together within the context of more current events um, and in a way that speaks both um, to the Episcopate and um, Bishop Stowe, you can speak to this, but also to the idea of intrinsic evil, which is something that um, Dr. Caveney, you've you've written quite a bit about, especially in your book, Laws Virtues. Um, so the question reads, Bishop McElroy of San Diego is a moral theologian and has criticized the statement in forming consciences that abortion is the bishop's quote unquote preeminent priority. Yet in the past week, two bishops publicly disputed Bishop McElroy. In the words of one, quote unquote, abortion is intrinsically evil and is thus the preeminent moral issue for Catholics, end quote. What are your thoughts on these recent disagreements between bishops, and if I may be so pointed, broader divisions between bishops in the church that often seem more animated by partisanship than theology? I'm not sure we're always talking the same language even, because when we talk about those intrinsically evil acts, the document itself lists a number of them, not just abortion. And I think uh, Bishop McElroy makes a very good case that intrinsic means that the act by itself can't be justified in, in any context. It doesn't mean it has more urgency or more priority or more importance than some of the other issues. Now, when you say preeminent uh, priority, then it does put it to the top of the list. And I can understand that logically, but I think you can also make a logical case that you know, if you don't have an environment that sustains life, if the planet is on the verge of destruction, how is that not the preeminent issue? If you talk about what comes first. So again, I'll refer to the ethicist on the question of in, in, intrinsic moral evil, but the introduction of that phrase, I think has been problematic all along in these documents. I think uh, Bishop, you're entirely right. And it, it's very, very disheartening um, because you know, the term intrinsic evil, like the term cooperation with evil, are technical terms of Catholic moral theology, which is a wonderful tradition of trying to reason precisely about how we act. And so these terms have, you know, very technical meanings, you know, as you know, as, as Bishop McElroy has pointed out, within, within the tradition. So an intrinsic evil is an act that is wrong by reason of its object, not by reason of its, um, you know, circumstance or end. So intentionally killing the innocent is an intrinsic evil. Uh, intentionally torturing someone is an intrinsically evil. So there are, you know, there are, but also in the tradition are, you know, other kinds of intrinsic evils. So you know, the use of birth control, according to Catholic moral theology, is an intrinsic evil, artificial, you know, birth control that's meant to separate the two goods of sex. Masturbation is an intrinsic evil. Um, you know, there are other 
acts that are intrinsically evil that, that we would say, the tradition would say, you can't do this. But that by itself doesn't tell us what the law should do about those acts or what public policy in a divided world, you know, a, a divided society should do about addressing those acts. So I think that what they're doing is using this term intrinsic evil. It sounds horrible, right? Intrinsic evil. Um, it, in almost a prophetic way, but, you know, kind of because it sounds so bad, but it really doesn't help us think through the hard questions of, well, how do you think about coming up with a law on abortion in a society which is deeply divided on it and where, um, where it also turns out that the latest study shows that people are divided among themselves. What kind of law would work? How would you think about a law? How would you think about passing a law? So the intrinsic evil language hides more than it helps, I think. Uh, and, and, and it hides, you know, even, even when it comes to doing something about abortion. But when it comes to ranking abortion with other, with other issues, I think if you go back to the question that says, well, what we really have to do is you know, is take care of the vulnerable, um, and and we really need to move toward that. I mean, the in word intrinsic evil doesn't help rank. You know, as you said, you know, climate change versus abortion versus these other issues. It's the, it's a political priority. It's understandable why it's some people's political priority, but that's not a reason rooted in the tradition for why it has to be every Catholic's political priority. It's not a reason at all. It's just a kind of a muddled statement. Do you make any sense of when the document talks about support for same-sex marriage being an intrinsic evil? That that takes all kind of gymnastics to, I, I don't know how that even that makes sense. Well, I mean, it's not even clear, you know, uh, how, so uh, the term intrinsic evil applies to an action. So marriage isn't an action, right? So it's not clear how that's even an act. It's a right. And to support um, a policy which would redefine marriage. Of an intrinsic evil. So I, I, it just, it, what I worry about this is, you know, the, the great, uh, I think he's probably one of the greatest living philosophers, Alistair McIntyre, said one of the biggest problems in our era is emotivism. Everybody thinks there's no such thing as moral reasoning. It's just simply, I'm expressing a, you know, a more an emotion, you know, I don't like this, I don't like this. And there's really no reasoning and any attempt at reasoning is just a cover for a strong, um, a rational emotion about a certain action. When the Bishop's Conference misuses its own terminology in such a great, uh, in, in such a really flagrant fashion, I think what's happening is it's not, helping convince anybody who's not convinced. It's not helping to justify people who already agree with them. It's just creating more cynicism about the worthwhile nature of moral language. I mean, it just makes it look like it's just one more tool to manipulate people. And I think that's a bigger problem. Um, another question, kind of following up on, on um, the idea of discerning strategies, um, which really is, involves prudence, as you both have talked about. Um, the question says, this is especially for Professor Caveney as a lawyer and a theologian, I'm pro-life, but I don't think overturning Roe v. Wade is the best strategy to address abortion. If church teaching on conscience allows people to discern the best issue strategies, why do church leaders seem to narrowly focus on this strategy, almost implying that it's the only one? Wow, that's a tough question. I have um, I have a, a view on this. Um, I think that Roe v. Wade itself was interpreted by many Catholics, by many pro-life Catholics, um, as really a direct assault on Catholic social teaching for one particular reason. And that reason was it said that the unborn was not a person. So it was drawing distinctions 
between some human beings who are people and other human beings who aren't people because it would you know it's kind of hard to deny that it's human uh, the unborn and i think that so many catholics saw that so many people saw that so many bishops saw that is is really undermining um the heart of human equality that they focus their effort on getting rid of Roe v. Wade for that reason. But abortion is a very complicated question, even if you acknowledge the full humanity of, of the unborn, because this is really a very unique situation, right? Because you've got one very vulnerable person who's totally physically dependent on another very vulnerable person and whom ideally is going to be in a relationship with that person their entire life if the pregnancy goes to term. I mean, you'd like ideally to see that relationship. So I think if you're going to look at how to deal with abortion, you have to look at, well, what do you want? You know, what is your goal? And, and the goal is, you know, is life and relationship for the mother and for the baby. And then you have to think, well, how can I get to that goal? And, and what can the law realistically do? And, and I think it, it makes sense for people to think, well, you know, the law can't realistically, given what we know of, you know, the methods of abortion, chemical abortion, the two-step two abortion pill, you know, maybe we ought not to focus only on prohibition, that's, that's um, supply side, but we really need to focus as well, and maybe even primarily um, in the first instance on demand side. You know, how do we make it so that women don't feel they need to have an abortion? How do we make it feel that they're not going to go seek out an illegal abortion, which even if you prohibit it, it would be very easy to obtain. And so, I think we have to start thinking about the broader questions. And I think actually, if you read Evangelium Vitae, that's a lot of, you know, in a non-politicized way, that's what Pope John Paul II was talking about with the culture of life. It was supporting the vulnerable, not simply prohibiting, you know, bad acts that would harm them. Because the vulnerable, you and I are going to be fine if people don't kill us. The vulnerable, whether they're you know a very elderly people, profoundly uh, people with profound disabilities, or the unborn, they need help from other people, and that's what a culture of life does. Um, so I, I would like to see us broaden the conversation and think about the practicalities of law, and also the practicalities of of law in a stable uh, way in a very pluralistic and divided society. I think Pope Francis's view of the interconnectedness of everything comes into play here as well. And when he talks about our conversion, we, the need for conversion from being a throwaway culture, right. because if, you're, if you can throw away the handicapped, and if you can throw away the terminally ill, if you can throw away the unborn, where does that end? And, and we right. continuously see that, that ranking of who is disposable, but that the solution is not in the law, the solution is in the conversion. Right. Um, another question, um, kind of synthesizing things that we've talked about, brings up um, the idea really of values, but also of language. Um, and so this question um, asks, the urgency of our political moment is especially perilous for black and brown people, as well as for people marginalized on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity. What sort of moral language is adequate to recognizing the utter disregard for the human dignity of so many people who have been endangered and are endangered by the Trump administration? At what point do our calls for calm and civility become complicit with the outcomes of these policies? Um, so really a question, Dr. Caveney, especially your, um, your work on prophetic rhetoric um, and Bishop Stowe, your um, you're talking about civility and, and culture of encounter, I think, are especially uh, relevant to this. So do either one of you have uh, thoughts about that? Uh, Bishop, why don't you start with this one? Okay. Yeah, I, I hope people heard in, in my presentation the frustration that, that the issues relating to people of color are not 
sufficiently brought forth in here and the harm done to people of color by this administration are not at all adequately addressed. It's one of my major frustrations about not creating a whole new document where we could have incorporated the language of Pope Francis, where we could have incorporated um, this resistance to a throwaway culture. And then now with Fratelli Tutti seeing that this, the interconnection of all humanity and how we're responsible for each other. Um, you know, in the, in the previous document, the 2016 document, there was more emphasis on the redefinition of marriage and, and, and the issues of homosexuality. And I remember saying in the bishops conference meeting, you know, we heard Pope Francis tell us US bishops that let everything that, come, that you say be seen and heard as merciful. And no matter what philosophical background or theological background we're coming from as we make these pronouncements they're affecting human beings and they're, they're questioning the worth of human beings and the human beings own self understanding of their worth. And so even our language of intrinsically disordered is problematic in that language and I get myself in trouble every time I say it now I'm on record saying it again, but it is problematic for that reason. Um, we've seen a, an upsurge of people of all races coming together and saying yes. This the treatment of black people by law enforcement has to change. We've seen it across the country. We, we have seen the issue when it was only because so many people raised their voice about tearing children away from their mothers at the border and putting children in cages. And, and I still have people write to me denying that that even happened, that it was an invention of the, of the media. But, but even those, it was because people stood up and said, no, we cannot see that. Well, we do need to see more of that. And I think that is the appropriate moral response. And I think this is where one of the areas where this document is lacking so badly. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I guess my question is, and I wish there were a way to knit these two things together. When we see great evil or when we see something we don't like, we engage in prophetic denunciation. You know, we denounce the, you know, and that is, is, is in some ways an understandable strategy. It's a good strategy. It's got, you know, weight in the Bible. But I guess the question I've been thinking more about as an ethicist is, what is the kind of way you can talk to people to change their minds and hearts? How do you, how do you talk to somebody whose heart is hardened on, on, on the dignity. People don't look exactly like, you know, like they do, or like the leave it to beaver suburbs in the 1950s. And, you know, maybe those people have dignity, but the people who have the most dignity are the people who just happen to be just like them. How do you open people's hearts to the dignity of other people? And I, I think that telling stories uh, is is really important. Not stories as in made up things, but I think the culture of encounter, we were talking about Pope Francis earlier, you can encounter somebody by working with them, but you also encounter people by, by listening to their story, by hearing what they've gone through, by seeing, well, this person, you know, may not live their life the same way. They may not have the same color, you know, of skin that I have, but they are every bit as human and, and as beloved by God as I am. And I have an obligation to them under those things. So I would like to see ethicists and bishops and, and, and moral leaders in this country actually work with cognitive psychologists and try to figure out how do we change people's minds? Do arguments change people's minds? I, I, I don't know. I've been making arguments for a long time and once in a while, I think there was one person once, you know, maybe <laughs> the back of a classroom who said, oh, wow. But the problem is we're so focused on arguments. I, I think there was a, uh, I'm not sure if it was, it was an analytic philosophy. I'm not sure if it was Thomas Nagel or not. I, I think I've got the wrong philosopher, so I'm sorry. But who said, it was quoted by Jeffrey Stout, who said, what we all want is a superpower argument, an argument so powerful, it sets up reverberations in the brain. Either the person we're talking about accepts the argument or their head explodes. But that's, you know, that's not how 
conversion works. I mean, maybe St. Paul got knocked off the horse, but the rest of us, it's a process and you have to put down your defenses in order to allow your heart to be changed. And I think one of the things that the Catholic Church should be doing on all of these things, on race, um, on, on sexual minorities, is, is trying to provide a context where people can get together and actually see each other as, as human, is to have that encounter as fully in the same community. And I think the best way to do that is actually working side by side with one another for something, for something that everybody agrees is good. You know, another, a corporal work of mercy, um, a, a, a rebuilding of a house. I think when you work with somebody who you think is not like you on something that you both agree is good, the common project has, has an epistemological opening and allows you to see the people you're working with in a different way. So I'd love to see in this post-COVID era, the church try to encourage, uh, I don't know, um, George, uh, you know, Sister Simone Campbell and George Weigel to go do a Habitat for <laughs> Humanity project together. There you, you go. Know, that, that has been successful in, in ecumenism. We've gotten yeah. farther than that than we have in doctrinal discussion. You're welcome, George. Discussions. Um, I agree with the stories, the breaking bread, the working on projects together. Um, the, the one other element I would add to that, and I, uh, I've seen it done well, is so much of the anti-immigrant or anti-gay or anti-whatever right. sense comes out of a place of fear. Right. And when there is a space given for that fear or the sense of loss to be acknowledged, like parishioners who don't like these people taking over our church. Right. Right. But what they're really mourning is the loss of their own traditions and their own cultures and the number of people to sustain what that was. And so on one level, they can be happy that the church is going to survive with a different culture, but, but they're resistant and somewhat hostile. And it comes out as against the people when there's no other forum for discussing it. So the sense of loss and the sense of hurt that have happened um, have to be addressed somehow. I can I'll also think of a, a communication I had with, with somebody who was so angry about um, offering welcome uh, to gays and lesbians, LGBTQ community, and was so angry and was consistently just, just badgering me about this and I trying to get to what's the bottom of it. And it, it turns out that he struggled with his own identity and, and felt that he had played by the rules all these years. And now how can the church be welcoming instead of condemning when, when I suffered this in silence? But it, it turned around when asked, do you wanna see somebody else go through that same suffering? Wouldn't you wanna save somebody from that suffering? But that takes a lot of intense listening and, and, and providing for that we don't always have anymore. And it certainly can't be done on Twitter. No, I don't think any of this. And I also, at the risk of, you know, being a little controversial here, I mean, I think there's a temptation, you know, for Catholics to adopt some version of the American prosperity gospel where, you know, if we are well respected, we are really burgered where we, we've, you know, We've got all our kids and they're all in line and you know, we've got our lawn mode and where everything is perfect. Well, God must favor us and you know, and that really must be what God wants. And you know, actually God really wants just everybody to be just like us. So there's a kind of form of idolatry, but it's it's a self-idolatry in some of this. And and you know, if you read the gospels, you know. I think the fundamental problem with the Pharisees, and you've got to be really careful when you talk about the Pharisees because you can get into, you know, anti-Semitic tropes incredibly mm -hmm. fast. But you know, to the extent it applies, it, it, it's saying, you know, don't use yourself, especially if you seem to be having some success right now, as the measure of everyone else. That's another form of egoism, and that's not encountering God. You encounter God. 
we know where you'll encounter God in, 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 in the poor and in the least of us. I mean, you know, and so stop looking at yourself and start looking, you know, where Jesus is in your life. And it's not in the mirror. Amen. There's a question that I think actually um, really follows that up uh, well in terms of the role and the status of the U.S. Catholic community vis-a-vis -vis, um, American society. And so synthesizing a couple of questions, but using one as, a, as kind of the trunk, um, do you think that the current document is sufficiently attentive to the minority status of Catholics in the United States? Um, and if not, what changes to the document would be, um, I guess, more encompassing or, or more cognizant of our community's minority status vis-a-vis um, -vis the broader polity? Could you just explain the question a little bit? Like, you mean the minority status that we're only 20 to 25% of the country or that the, there's an increasing number of people of color within the you know, within the Catholic Church? The way that I read the question is is more the former. Um, minority status in terms of the U.S. Catholic community, in terms of being roughly 20%, as you say, of, of the U.S. population. Do you think that the document is overly ambitious or aspirational in terms of trying to transform the broader culture? Um, or do you think that the changes need to be made in terms of um, expectations of being able to, to transform culture given that status? Hmm. You wanna start with that one? I'm not quite sure what to do with that, Bishop. Well, it, it's a different way of posing the question for sure. I am in a diocese where 3% of the total population is Catholic. So I know something about being a minority. It's very different from the world that I came from, especially when I was on the border in, in El Paso, a very different environment altogether. But here, I know that the only way the church is gonna have any impact is when we are ecumenical, when we're working with other churches, when we recognize that to have a gospel voice or, or the Christian message is more important than the denominational message. So uh, I, I don't see any of that in this document. This document is coming from Catholic moral thinking. And we do have a strong tradition. That's one of those assets that we have to bring to the square. So I understand it. I don't think we should be shy about trying to transform society. I think Jesus and the apostles were shy about that. It was very aspirational what they were trying to do with, with a few people. Um, so, but I think there, there is room for more collaboration, especially ecumenically, if we want to make an impact. I think if we focus on consciences, well, when we're talking about individuals within the church, I think it, it had narrowed this, the scope of the document anyway. Um, I think to interrupt you, Dr. Kavita, I think, I think ecumenism is, is really the, the operative word. It's not used in the question, but I think maybe ecumenism is, is really what's, um, what's animating this question in particular. Maybe the question is, I mean, it's interesting. If you look back at the first document the bishops came out with, you know, uh, the, the one that uh, was, uh, you know, issued in 1976, it really was addressed to all people of goodwill. Um, you know, it was meant to kind of not just be addressed to Catholics and faithful citizenship was really, although it's happy if other people listen, was focused on forming the Catholic vote, particularly against relativism. So you can see that different iterations of the, the document have taken different stances on this. Another way of thinking about this, though, um, is who are we going to be ecumenical with? Um, there's lots of different groups, and I think that a lot of, you know, faithful citizenship and that a lot of the bishops have really wanted to be ecumenical with, you know, evangelical Protestants, Southern evangelical Protestants, because they do have the same views, you know, on, on the on religious, li you know, religious liberty. They see uh, Christianity and or, you know, traditional Christianity as being marginalized and beleaguered. Uh, they want to focus on abortion. They wanted to focus on, uh, you know, opposing same-sex marriage. So maybe what we need to is be a little bit more ecumenical about our ecumenicalness um, and, and see ourselves as in conversation with a broader array of groups. Um, Good point. Um, another another question um, 
kind of following up on, on another word that you use, Bishop Stowe, and that we've talked about um, a few different times is that of conscience. And so kind of synthesizing a few questions. Um, in my experience, many Catholic leaders have impoverished understandings of conscience and levels of church teaching authority and prefer to form consciences exactly like their own. My own priest has referenced forming consciences and all but said anyone with a properly formed conscience will vote for a particular candidate, presumably his. Do you think forming, consci do you think forming consciences sufficiently treats uh, conscience? And if not, what changes would better articulate the church's traditional teaching about the primacy, dignity, and inviolability of conscience? I think that one was yours, Bishop. <laughs> oh, I thought it was yours. <laughs> I, I don't think the document does that. I mean, I, first of all, if it's issued in a political election year, we have to recognize that now, especially with the, la the current president, we're always in campaign season. There was no governing. It was always campaign season. And in the midst of, of heated campaign rhetoric, it's not the time to form consciences. So... Um, what I said earlier was the importance of that remote preparation, which is a lifelong challenge. It's lifelong work. I, I don't know that our catechetical programs are good enough at doing that. Pope Francis, from his Ignatian Jesuit background, is always talking about discernment. Um, you know, I, I found one of the, the challenges to implementing Amoris Laetitia is that it depends so much on discernment, and I'm not sure that's taught in seminaries outside of religious orders, that you know, how do you discern with people what is the moral choice? It, it's not check a box. It's not this or that. It, 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 it requires this, this lifelong commitment to conversion. So I don't think that the document is, is sufficient for that. It's got to be a, the, a much larger project for the church. Our liturgy should be about forming consciences. Our catechesis should be about forming consciences. Our social service should be about forming consciences and helping people reflect on that because we do it, but we don't always uh, help people to reflect on that. I think that that's, that that's true. I mean, it, very often, if you, I shouldn't say this, I sometimes think, you know, on a, on, on a kind of a sad day when I look at faithful citizenship is that although they say they don't want people to vote in a particular way, they really do want to kind of mobilize the Catholic vote and move it in a particular direction, um, almost like, well, like shepherds and sheep. And I know that the church uses those images and they are appropriate in certain contexts, but they're not appropriate in the voting booth, right? You know, th and that's not the, the best way to think about the relationship of bishops to Catholic lay people in the context of our, you know, of our democracy, the, thinking about ourselves as, as all the people of God, thinking about ourselves as having a common priesthood as well as a, you know, um, you know, an ordained priesthood, both of which have roles, I, I think is, is a better way of thinking about how we relate to one another as Catholics, but also as citizens. The relationship of a Catholic to a bishop in the church is one thing. The relationship to a Catholic and a bishop as you and I are about to go in and cast our vote as American citizens is a different relationship. So maybe part of what we need to talk about isn't only forming consciences, but also what does it mean to respect a conscience and to respect somebody's own role related obligations and their sense of how they should fulfill them. You know, rather than kind of looking at this and saying, wow, well, you know, with the, I mean, I remember going to a meeting once, you know, with uh, some even evangelical Protestants and some Catholics, and they were sort of saying, well, you know, we, we guys, we've got 25% of the vote and you've got 20% of the vote together. We've almost got half of the vote. If we can mobilize all of us, we can run the country. And I said, okay, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm going to back out of here slowly. Um, you know, so there's, you know, it, it's not that there aren't political allies and, 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 and not that there's not political activism that goes on or that's perfectly legitimate, that's true. But when that becomes sort of the point of the whole church, rather than, you know, um, something that's, 
you know, much less important than the fundamental mis mission of the church and, and, uh, and our fundamental relationship to one another through the church, then, then I think you've got a distortion that's doing much more harm than good, both to the church and to the polity. Um, and I want to leave just um, a couple of minutes for uh, closing thoughts from both of you, but I think one last question kind of moving us in, in the direction in light of some of these potential limitations. Um, I think Bishop Stowe, especially for you, um, what is the likelihood that forming consciences is substantively reformed moving forward? Is there an appetite among your brother bishops for that? And if I may ask a follow-up, how would that happen logistically? I wish I knew. The, the, the last vote was pretty decisive that they didn't want to rewrite. Um, there was all the attention was given to creating those videos. I don't know whatever happened with those videos or how they were distributed, but um, I don't think there's a, a big appetite for that. It would happen through committee work. Probably there's a number of committees that are involved in that, but the doctrine committee seems to have a lot of authority in, in how that the document is put together, but. I wouldn't be very hopeful about uh, uh, changing that. Oh well, my goodness, maybe in 2028. There we go. Well, thank you both. As I said, I want to provide the last um, couple of minutes for any any closing thoughts. Um, Bishop Stowe, deferring to you, any any closing thoughts, reflections um, in light of the questions, in light of uh, Professor Cavani's insights, um, any final word? Well, I'm just so grateful for the number of people that participated in this. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with Dr. Caveney this this night and to share thoughts with her. I'm I'm grateful that there's a there's a way to think about this, uh, you know, this upcoming election that that we don't have to be trapped into this uh, the false choices that are are sometimes placed there. Obviously, we only have two possibilities as candidates, but how we think about how we vote um, is in a much broader context now. Thank you. And Dr. Caveney, giving you the last word, any, any closing thoughts in, in response to questions or insights from Bishop Stowe? Uh, well, I was just so moved and inspired by the Bishop's statement, uh, opening statement, and so uh, motivated to continue our, our task of, 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 of faithful citizenship understood in the right way. Um, and, and I look forward to doing that. And I guess I would just encourage everyone um, both to vote and to pray for our country and our world. Um, because I think, uh, I think St. Thomas Aquinas said that prayer is the highest form of secondary causality. Um, so I think we, I think our country needs it now. So if we all do that, even everybody here, I think we'll be better off. And thank you, Professor DeLeo, for this for this kind invitation. Good. Well, that's that's a pretty good mic drop moment to end with Thomas. Uh, I don't know that we can do any better than that. Um, logistically speaking, um, several questions have come through about um, the recording. So this has been recorded. The recording will be available uh, to folks who have registered. We had um, over 1,200 registrants at one point tonight. We had over 400 participants. Um, listening to this. And so I, I'm so grateful for all of you for taking the time out of your evening. Um, and again, on behalf of Creighton University, especially grateful to Bishop Stowe and uh, Professor Caveney for giving uh, both their time, but also their uh, talents and expertise to helping us think through these things. So um, again, look for an email um, with this recording. And once again, thank you uh, to all of our audience members for participating and especially to Bishop Stowe and Dr. Caveney for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.